Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Michael Lamatra? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosed anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Michael Lamatra was born on September 2, 1946, and was raised in the state of New York. After graduating from high school, he went to college at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. When he was there, he met a woman named Peggy. The couple married, had three children, and lived in Anchorage. Michael earned a Ph.D. in business administration and was a grief counselor. He spent 18 years working at a local Air Force base, and volunteered in the community. Michael and Peggy were active outdoors. They would frequently take their family camping, fishing, and hiking. They would go for family trips in a recreational vehicle. Michael was particularly sensation-seeking. He did not really have much fear. He was always finding one adventure or another. In the 1980s, he wanted to learn how to cross-country ski. Instead of signing up for lessons, he went on a 210-mile race through the wilderness. He ended up competing in this race a few times. He finished in last place twice. On another occasion, Michael and a friend of his went on a 120-mile sailing trip in a small boat southwest of Anchorage. The boat began to peel apart in the middle of a river. They made temporary repairs and continued their journey. Michael would go swimming in the freezing waters of a lake called Big Lake, which is north of Anchorage. As a side note, there are over 3 million lakes in Alaska, and only 3,197 have been given official names. Still, I get the sense that whoever named Big Lake did not invest enough creative effort. When they were asked what to name it, were they like, I don't know, it's a lake and it's big. How about Big Lake? What makes this worse is that there's actually three lakes in Alaska named Big Lake, Michael accumulated an impressive list of adventures that almost ended in disaster, but somehow did not. He loved telling his tales of near death. Michael was described as determined, stubborn, reckless, and lucky. His objective was always centered on enjoyment. He didn't like to carefully plan, or really plan at all, because that eliminated the spontaneity, which he believed was crucial to having fun. In early 2012, 65-year-old Michael applied to compete in a well-known foot race that takes place in Seward, Alaska, which is two and a half hours south of Anchorage. The race is called the Mount Marathon Race. It is held each year on the 4th of July. The race was first held in 1915. Based on a local legend, it came about because people wondered if it was possible to run up the mountain next to the town of Seward and back down in under one hour. After a few people attempted the route, it became an official race. The race starts in downtown Seward. Competitors run about a half mile to the foot of Mount Marathon. At this point, they climb 2,900 vertical feet up the mountain until they reach a false summit marked by a large rock. This is referred to as turnaround point. As the name suggests, this is where runners start heading back down the mountain which they do via a different route to avoid congestion. The entire race is only 3.1 miles, one and a half miles up and 1.6 miles down. The record time for the men's race is about 41 minutes. For the women's race, it's about 47 minutes. What the race lacks in distance, it makes up for in sheer brutality. Every year there are several injuries, including broken bones. The history of the race is littered with human suffering, misery, and agony. There have been dislocations, compound fractures, and brain injuries. Runners have been impaled by tree branches and shale. During a race in the 1980s, 53 people were treated for heat illness. A bear chased a woman on one occasion. She injured her ankle trying to escape. The bear was probably just trying to give her an invitation to dinner. Despite the dangerousness of the race, or perhaps because of it, the Mount Marathon race is exceptionally popular. There are sometimes more applicants to run in the race than there are slots available. Runners who have completed a certain number of other races 
and those who have run in the race in the past are given priority as far as entry. The remaining slots are filled using a lottery. For 2012, when Michael applied to run the race, there were 60 slots available through the lottery for the men's race. Michael managed to win one of the slots. He received a letter in the mail notifying him that he won. The letter said, do not make the July 4th race your first trip up the mountain. Michael was in pretty good shape physically. He regularly went to the gym and lifted weights, but he had never been up Mount Marathon before. Considering how unprepared Michael was and the race's reputation for inflicting life-changing injuries, both Michael's wife and daughter tried to discourage him from racing, but Michael disregarded their warnings. He was determined to race. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. On July 3, 2012, Michael and the other racers attended a safety meeting at Seward Middle School. The man running the meeting told the racers that if they had not been up Mount Marathon before, they should consider going home immediately. They should not be in the race. Michael knew that he should not be running the race, but he was not discouraged by this reasonable warning. The racers were told about landmarks along the route, as well as some of the hazards they could expect to encounter, like falling rocks, slippery conditions, and bears. Michael remained unfazed. On July 4, Michael prepared to run the race. His wife asked him if he was sure he wanted to do this. Michael answered, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to take it slow. Peggy told him to come back to her. Michael replied, I will. Don't worry. I'll be back. The race started at 3.10 p.m. After running on the streets of Seward for a short distance, the men started climbing Mount Marathon. At 4.30 p.m., Michael was about at the halfway point up the mountain. At this time, many of the other racers were already finished. Michael was in last place by quite a bit. A man named Tom Walsh was the lead mid-course timekeeper for the race. Not long after 5 p.m., Tom was at turnaround point, which was marked by a large rock in the middle of a grassy area. One of the runners approached Tom and said he was the last racer, which was not true. Michael was in last place. Tom and a few other race officials waited for about 45 minutes and then started heading down the mountain. The route up the mountain is different than the route down, but as Tom was heading down, he and a few other race officials were able to see Michael about 300 feet away, slowly climbing the mountain. This was at about 6 p.m. Michael called out to Tom, How far am I from the top? Tom replied, About 200 feet. Michael then asked him if he could still get a finish. Tom told him to loop around the rock at turnaround point and go down the mountain via the descent trail. Tom noticed that Michael was not moving very quickly, but otherwise did not detect any signs of distress. He asked for Michael's bib number, which Michael provided, 548. Tom sent a text to other race officials saying that bib number 548 would be finishing in about an hour and a half. Tom did not note at the time, but rather than an hour and a half, a more accurate estimate was never. At about 8 p.m., Michael's family notified the authorities that he had not come down the mountain. A ground search started by 9 p.m. Over the next few hours, helicopters joined in the search. There was no sign of Michael. Various other search efforts took place over the next few days without success. Michael was officially declared dead in August of 2012, not long after he disappeared. At the time making this video, Michael remains missing. Now moving to my analysis. The relationship between the town of Seward and Michael's wife Peggy broke down not long after Michael disappeared. Peggy filed a lawsuit against the Seward Chamber of Commerce asking for $5 million. She claimed that the race officials were negligent. In 2014, the lawsuit settled for $20,000. The Chamber of Commerce denied any responsibility for Michael's death. They indicated that settling was simply a business decision. This leads me to the question. Does the Chamber of Commerce bear any responsibility for Michael's disappearance? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that they bear some responsibility, starting with the inculpatory factors. The race has a history of being exceedingly dangerous. During the same race where Michael disappeared, the one in 2012, two other racers were seriously injured. One has since fully recovered, 
but the other one sustained a traumatic brain injury. One could argue that the whole point of the race is to take a chance of being injured or killed. Many of the racers appear to be attracted to being in peril. The Chamber of Commerce charges a fee to enter the race. They make money from people risking their lives. Furthermore, because they're charging a fee, in theory they should be providing some services, like ensuring that people don't disappear on the mountain. At about 6 p.m. on the day that Michael disappeared, when he was encountered climbing up the mountain by race officials who were descending, it was clear that he was lagging behind dramatically. He wasn't even close to the other racers. Why didn't one of the race officials stop Michael from continuing? Moving to the exculpatory factors, Michael was repeatedly warned that no one should attempt to run in the Mount Marathon race unless they had been up the mountain previously. He had never been up the mountain, but decided to run anyway. Michael signed a waiver acknowledging the risk involved in the race. Michael was by far the worst performer in the race. Despite being in relatively good shape physically, he was nowhere near the level required to run the race. One physical problem that Michael had, which may have affected his safety, was poor eyesight. He had advanced glaucoma, and his lower field of vision was obliterated. His vision had been bad for some time. For example, in 2009, he filed a complaint with the EEOC against his employer, claiming he was discriminated against based on his disability, specifically his eyesight. He had recent eye surgery. His vision would eventually improve, but it wasn't too good at the time. During a deposition that was taken after this complaint was filed, Michael told EEOC investigators, quote, what I see as far as peripheral vision is I see somebody from the top of their head to the tip of their nose. It was over a month before I realized my supervisor had a goatee, unquote. There are some indications that Michael's eyesight was good enough for the race. For example, during his last exam, he had 20-30 vision without his glasses, and he had a valid driver's license. Despite this, the loss of his peripheral vision is a cause for concern as far as seeing the trail in front of him during the race. As a side note, it's pretty frightening that Michael was able to get a driver's license. Perhaps this was part of Alaska's new campaign to promote tourism. Don't worry about the bears. They're nowhere as dangerous as our drivers. During the encounter with race officials at about 6 p.m., which was the last time Michael was seen, Michael made it clear he did not need assistance, and he wanted to continue to turn around point, which was only about 200 feet away. When considering all the evidence, do I think that the Chamber of Commerce was partly responsible for Michael's disappearance? Here's how I look at this. Mount Marathon is open to the public. People can hike on the mountain anytime they want. The race officials did not have the authority to tell Michael to stop climbing the mountain, although they could have disqualified him from the race. Clearly, Michael wanted to officially finish the race. So if they told him that he couldn't, he probably would have come down the mountain at that point. Either way, it was up to Michael whether he continued, and he chose to do so. At the same time, the Chamber of Commerce charged a fee to enter the race. So this really seems like a for-profit endeavor. I think the race organizers did bear a small amount of responsibility. They should have had somebody stay in visual contact with Michael if he was to continue, or disqualified him from the race and made sure that he descended the mountain safely. The race officials knew that the race was dangerous. If Michael had fallen and injured himself, that would have been on him. He knew that risk going in, but Michael disappeared, which is something that the race officials could have prevented. This was within their power without being overly restrictive and destroying the fun value of the race. Moving to the last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Michael had an overwhelming desire for excitement. It dominated many aspects of his life. He specifically liked activities that were dangerous. He was frequently reckless and impulsive, which only added to the exhilaration. When Michael was looking for his next adventure, he became attracted to the Mount Marathon race, specifically because of the danger element. That's what he wanted. Many sanctioned foot races are relatively safe, but the Mount Marathon race has never been accused of that offense. Michael knew that he had no chance of winning the race or even placing at a respectable level. He probably knew that he would be in last place, but that was okay with him. 
He just wanted to finish the race. He didn't care about competing against other people. He was only competing against the mountain. Michael's resume of exciting activities was not about performance. Rather, it was simply about completing a lot of tasks. Put another way, it was less about quality and more about quantity. The day before the race, Michael went to the safety meeting and heard the warnings. This only made him more eager. When they played a video showing graphic injuries to former racers, Michael was not discouraged. Rather, it had the opposite effect. All these warnings confirmed that the race was perfect for him. After Michael encountered race officials coming down the mountain, he made it to Turnaround Point. From this location, one trail goes down the mountain. This is the way that Michael should have gone. But another trail goes up the mountain to the true summit. Again, Turnaround Point is a false summit. I think Michael accidentally took the trail up the mountain, perhaps because he didn't realize that he was actually at Turnaround Point. He thought that he needed to go farther to get there. It didn't take too long for Michael to become lost. In addition, the temperatures were dropping, and he was becoming hypothermic. Disoriented and cold, Michael fell down a crevice, fell off of a cliff, or met some other horrible fate, which caused his death and prevented his body from being found. Now moving to my final thoughts. Danger is like a drug, and Michael appeared to be addicted. The inherent danger level of various outdoor experiences was not acceptable to Michael. Therefore, he amplified the hazards by being woefully unprepared. This is kind of like somebody driving a race car and removing their seatbelt simply to increase the risk of dying. Michael needed the thrill. It was not optional for him. On the day he disappeared, which is also likely the day that he died, Michael was not setting out to break any type of record, but he did. He became the only competitor to disappear from the Mount Marathon race. I don't think that Michael intended to die that day, but to Michael, living without a thrill was a fate worse than death. Those are my thoughts in the case of Michael LaMatra. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.